Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really sorry that I didn't manage to get there uh, in person or even probably live. Um, my health is a little bit up and down. So this is my window of clarity for today or relative clarity for today. And I thought I would at least try and offer a little summary of my paper um, for you in these next sort of 10, 15 minutes. Um, I also wanna say right at the start what a treat it is um, to be part of this conference with Sonia, um, whose book launch yesterday, book event yesterday, I found fascinating. Um, it's also a bit of an embarrassment for me to be talking about EQ in the context of somebody who's a, a genuine authority um, and someone on whose work I have uh, lent quite a lot actually in my own. That said, I'm uh, my focus is very different from hers. I'm not re I'm not a, a poetry scholar. Uh, my background is in philosophy, um, so I'm really looking at this this paper at least is going to orbit around one piece, one major piece by EQ, the the Gai from um, 1457. So this is a kind of illuminated prose work, um, usually translated as skeletons um, from from that period just before the Onin War, actually. So I just wanna go over some of the highlights of my paper um, and we'll see where that takes us. So let's have a go at that. I'm just gonna share my screen because I have some pretty pictures. All right. So my reading um, of EQ um, is, is pretty, in brief, um, is pretty influenced actually by some of the teachings, the contemporary teachings of the wonderful Buddhist um, activist, eco-dharma activist, Joanna Macy. Um, and what I'm thinking of in particular is her teaching that if this is, if we are living in the end times, if this is the end, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, what would it mean for us to live in these times with integrity, um, with dignity? And in, in some versions of that teaching that she sometimes gives, um, that ends up with something like, what would it be like to sim, sing the eulogy of the earth or something? So it's in that kind of spirit, that sort of, if we're at the end, what do we do? How do we live well? Um, that's the spirit in which I'm reading EQ. And I think, I don't think it's too violent to him to do that. Um, and I think for EQ in the end, you know, you know, are we living in the end times for him? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and how are we living? Are we living with that kind of integrity and dignity? Oh no, we're not. So we're in the end times for IQ, why? We're in the end times because of some of that kind of broad brush historical stuff. Um, it's a time of war, constant kind of war and civil conflict during his lifetime. Um, it's a time of occasional but persistent famine, disease, um, so we have all of that stuff going on. So there's kind of suffering, right? Um, but then I think for him, one of the crucial issues about this being the end or that being the end um, back, in, back in the day um, is the decay that he sees and the decadence and the corruption of Buddhism itself, particularly sort of institutional Buddhism. That is that for him is one of the main uh, causes of suffering. So if that's our, if that's the end times, um, are people living in an authentic and engaged way in, in this manner? So he's going to say no. And the reason, this is my reading of him at least, the reason that we're not living well, or they're not living well, um, is that they're living in denial of the fact that it's the end times. So he uses what seems to be a kind of metaphor that we're already, he says that we're already dead. There is nobody who is not already a skeleton. And he's gonna use this, which seems like a metaphor, um, as a way to reveal this denial. That is, if we're already dead, there's nobody who's not already a skeleton. Isn't it unseemly that we behave in kind of calculated ways, ways that are future oriented about the outcomes of our actions, um, about the profits, the advantages we might get to our wealth, um, to our prestige, to our reputation, and so on. Um, so it looks like a bit of a metaphor, but in this kind of classic Zen way, um, this apparent metaphor turns out to be 
fairly radically non-metaphorical. That is, it's Ikki's assertion, um, this metaphor is Ikki's assertion of the, of the kind of fundamental non-dualism um, of existence. That is, life is death. Death is life. Um, and then instructions. He gives us some sort of instructions about how we might live um, with that realization in that truth. Um, so my paper starts, and indeed the title of the paper is drawn from the bottom left-hand image on this screen, um, which shows the smoke on Mount Toribe. And Toribe being um, a mountain on the outskirts of Kyoto where funerals took place. So these are some images from uh, the Gaikotsu. Uh, they're probably, we think they're 17th century images. Um, there's some sort of attempt to assert that these images are from the pen, like wood, from the woodblock print made by EQ himself. It doesn't seem impossible, but it also seems a little bit implausible. <laughs> um, partly because by the time we're in the 17th century, um, EQ is something of a mythical, semi-mythical figure. Um, and I think it would have just added a whole bunch of prestige to this uh, publication to claim it was by his hand. But it's a pretty early uh, illust illustration uh, illustrated version of his text. Um, so what's going on here? I'm just going to start with the poem that accompanies that image. And it's something like, and this is my own terrible, non-very poetic translation. Such sorrow for the world in the evening smoke over Mount Toribe. For how long can we see it as the grief of strangers? So this poem to me is doing two things. It's a poem, so the text is prose text with inset poems. Um, this poem for me is doing at least a couple of things. Firstly, there's a kind of obvious pathos or sadness about death, right? Like it's a sad thing when somebody dies. But the second thing about it, we layer it with another layer of sadness, right? Another layer of kind of suffering. And that's the sadness that the poet is feeling um, at the denial um, that people are experiencing when they think that sadness is somebody else's. So we've got this sort of, let me read the poem again. Such sorrow for the world in the evening smoke over Toribe, for how long can we see it as the grief of strangers? So for him, this is one of the ways that he starts to talk about a kind of crisis of bad faith in the world around him. That is that people are living in a kind of denial um, of the fact of their own death. The fact that this is not only a world of um, end times, but it's also that always and already dead for themselves. This is the death of somebody else isn't the death of somebody else. It's not just their problem, right? So there's a kind of existential tragedy going on here. And Gaikotsu as a, an essay, as a kind of meditation, is a sort of extended treatment of this thing. So I'm going to show you like another, some more images from this, uh, from this kind of quirky piece. Um, you might have seen some of these before. And the, the essay is full of skeletons doing just regular stuff, <laughs> right? Doing the stuff of everyday life. And you can, you know, you can work out what some of these, some of these people are doing. Um, but instead of being kind of fleshly people, they're depicted as skeletons doing those things um, because we're already dead. Um, one of the most effective ones, I think, is that top left one where they're actually, that, that person is kind of a fleshly person, semi-fleshly person. I guess he's got a skull. Um, and they're taking, it's sometimes called um, on the way home or something. So it's skeletons carrying somebody off to their funeral, right, to the funeral pile. So in good Buddhist fashion, um, IQ sees this problem, problem of the end, the end times, uh, the problem of all the suffering that's going on. Um, so that's, what's that? That's our first noble truth, right? So in good Buddhist fashion, the question is, why is this happening? And so we're looking for the truth of the cause, right? And the truth of the cause is something, it's tempting to say, you know, that the cause is the famine and the war um, and the pestilence and all of these things. But for him, that's not really the, that's not the problem. They're like symptoms of the problem. That is the suffering. 
Um, so if that's the case, where is this, where is the suffering actually coming from? And for him, he points the finger really squarely um, at the corruption of Buddhism and the corruption of Zen and Rinzai Zen in particular. Um, and he, he argues that Rinzai Zen and Buddhism in Japan at that time is failing to teach and failing to model the truth that we're already dead. And indeed, that Rinzai Zen is kind of modeling the opposite of this. That is, it's indulging in really worldly concerns. It's raising lots of money. We had Sonia yesterday talking to us about money, boats, and Zen. It's exactly his, the thing that he thinks is the problem. Um, you know, Zen temples selling certificates of um, enlightenment to rich patrons and things like this. So he points his finger really squarely. And one of the uh, stories that sort of reveals this, this is the, uh, the portrait of Ikkyu that is slightly less famous than the one that Sonia showed yesterday. Um, this is not by Boksai, but it is uh, kind of, it arises from a story that Boksai tells about his teacher in 1435, I think. So this is when Ikkyu is living in Sakai city um, outside of Kyoto and kind of moving backwards and forwards. He has a kind of slightly semi-itinerant lifestyle at that time. Um, so the story is something like uh, he's living in that, in that little town and he's only sort of semi-officially a priest in that town. Um, so he used to give sort of impromptu Dharma talks. And one of these Dharma talks, Dharma talks is Dharma in action. So he went wandering around the streets one morning, we're told, um, with a giant sword. And you can see in this portrait there, the representation of the sword. It's quite unusual, as you will be aware, to have an image of a, a Zen Buddhist priest or a Buddhist priest sitting there with a giant sword. So why has he got that sword? It's from this story, from this incident in his life recorded by Boksai, his student. Um, and the story is something like, um, he wanders around with this sword until people notice that he's carrying a sword around. And they ask him, you know, why are you carrying this sword around? That's not an appropriate thing. Um, Zen priests, Buddhist priests shouldn't be carrying swords. Swords are, are um, instruments of death, not of life. You can imagine the kinds of things. Um, and at some point, EQ stops and says, you know, he's holding his sword. Uh, you don't know this yet. I'm quoting here. You don't know this yet, but these days, the world is full of false wisdom that is just like this sword. As long, it is kept, as long as it is kept in its scabbard, it looks as good as a real blade. But when it's drawn out of the scabbard, drum roll, <laughs> what happens when it's drawn out of the scabbard? It's drawn out and it's seen to be only a sliver of wood. It cannot even kill people, let alone bring them life. So what's going on in this little story? For him, the fake sword inside the shiny exterior, that's the Buddhist establishment at that time. That it's, it's lost its way and become obsessed with the shininess and the appearance and lost its substance, lost its edge, right? lost its cutting edge. So this story um, from, we think about 1435, um, is from the same period of his life to, from this very famous story that some of you will know, which is probably a story that was made up um, part of that kind of EQ boom in the Tokugawa period uh, where all kinds of fantastical, interesting stories get, get told about EQ. Um, but here's a similar story. This is set, supposed to be set in the same city from his Sakai period when he was living in that city, that little town. Um, and this is it's New Year's Day. Um, and everybody's celebrating and being happy and hopeful about the future and wishing each other good fortune, things like this. Um, and EQ decides, you can see him there in the middle in a kind of classic representation of him, um, decides that he's going to wander around the city with a big pole with a skull on the end to make sure that everybody realizes that, um, that they're already dead. So we get, all, we get stories like this uh, from, from that period. We go more than a year ahead then, we can, several, a couple more years ahead, heading up towards the uh, composition of Gaikotsu. Um, so in about 1440, 
this is really building on on this story this story about the falseness of institutional zen um, when we get to 1440 um, we, we have this weird moment in Iku's life where he's sort of invited into the inside of institutional Zen. Um, so he becomes the abbot of the uh, Nyoyan, which is a subtemple of the um, Daitokuji. But within two weeks of becoming the abbot, he quits. And he quits in this kind of big dramatic fashion, um, posting up uh, poetry on the walls for everybody to see about how appalled he is about the corruption and the red tape um, and the bureaucracy um, and the kind of false austerity of these temples. Um, and he, the letter he sends to the abbot of Daitokuji is basically, you know, if you want to find me again, then come and look for me in a fish shop <laughs> um, or a tavern or a brothel. That's where I'll be because that's where the real work is being done. Right? So, okay. I'm almost finished. In the end, okay, so we've got that, we know what the problem is, right? The problem is that we're living at the end of the world. We're in denial of the fact that we're at the end of the world and that we're already dead. Um, and that Buddhism is messing this up for us, particularly Zen is messing this up for us because its message is, is, um, is lost in its own pretense. It's become kind of commodified. So we're in this situation where in, in his essay, in the Gaikotsu essay, um, he writes his own very helpful kind of exegetical conclusion to tell us what we should have made of, of the essay. And this begins with something like, there is nobody who is not already a skeleton. This is like his crucial insight. So the shiny kind of distractions, the shiny denials, the scabbard, if you like, that, has, uh, that we think is making everything better for us is actually making it worse. We shouldn't be investing in those things. They're the causes of the suffering and not its solution. And that the Zen institution isn't helping this because it's actually the cause of the problem that it has succumbed to that problem. So this is not only, it's gonna get a little bit more profound about Buddhism here. It's not only um, about that historical moment in which he is living. That is, it's not just about the corruption of Zen at that time that has brought about the conditions for the suffering that we're experiencing. Um, in denial that we're already dead. It's not only that historical moment, but it's actually, he pushes this further. It's actually um, our faith in the possibility that words and teachings um, can lead us into escape or liberation. So for him, when he really think, when he really contemplates it at the end of this piece, it's already too much denial to invest in the truth of the Buddha's teachings. It's kind of bad faith if you're hiding behind those and clinging to those as something that will liberate you from your death because you're already dead. Um, so instead, what does he want? Nice Rinzai move. Um, he just wants direct realization of the fact you're already dead. That's the only way out of this, the only way out of it. And he says that he is willing to and has thrown away, thrown out all 80,000 texts um, of the Buddhist camp, throws them out, and instead simply lives in the realization of his death. 